Hello, everyone. Delighted to see you at the Rencontre Économique Dex. My name is Emmanuel Duté. I'm the director of Usine Nouvelle. We're here to talk about AI, re-enchanting industries thanks to AI. So sometimes this is a tool that causes us to dream, maybe a bit too much. What are we talking about when we talk about AI, classic AI and generative AI? Is the first one is in companies and in industry for years now. The second is just a, taking baby steps. Does AI improve efficiency, performance, productivity of industry? And a very important point when we're going through a revolution like this, how can we bring the teams on board? I'll present the people who are with us to shed light on this. Beside me, beside, uh, we have Pierre Jacquet, then Eric Rinjolfsen, who is a professor at Stanford, Ming Gang Zong, uh, Olivier Nolan for SAP France, Doris Bicorfer, who is the president of Siemens France, and beside me, Guillaume Ligier, who launched an application based on AI, it's called Explain, and he will explain that to us. So, as is the tradition, we'll start with the coordinator of the Cercle, who's been uh, running between sessions. Pierre, please tell us what you think. So, what we call artificial intelligence, and particularly generative AI, it's a generic technology. Its effectiveness, its efficiency improves constantly, and there are applications in all human activities, and it generates itself a constant flow of innovation thanks to its use. It's not surprising that we're seeing an increased use of generative AI, and that's been accompanied by a real debate. There are optimists, enthusiasts who are confident in its potential for economic and social progress, and then we have pessimists prudent pessimists who talk about all of the doubts and obstacles. And the object of our round table is to clarify this debate. We're lucky enough to have heads of companies around the table. We talk to, to talk about their concrete experience, their challenges. And also we have with us one of the most recognized professors on this topic, Eric. And his work is really essential at the heart of this topic, not necessarily to predict the future, but to understand what is going on currently. The idea is that the productivity gains through gen these uh, generated innovations take place over several decades. For electricity, we talk about a half a century. The historian of innovations, Paul Lud David, analyzed the impact of the dynamo and and we talked about the paradox of the solo, who observed that there are computers everywhere except in the productivity figures. And with the advent of a generic innovation, this can lead to a stagnation and even a slowdown in productivity. And one of the main reasons for this is that the impact of such innovations can only be perceived when there are deep changes in behavior, in management, in the organization of tasks, in the nature of jobs, and in the training of the agents. And this all takes time. Having said that, productivity games, in my mind, raise two questions. The first, which is well illustrated by a recent book by Robert Gordon, the Rise and Fall of American Growth, published in 2016, and this concerns the nature of change, the quality of life that is created by innovation. So to be brief, Gordon observed that the visible progress of digital allows everyone to play on their mobile phones, and it can't bring the same social gains as electricity did. So he was criticizing the quality of the growth that is created by these innovations. And I think there's a real topic here. It shows that we have to be concerned by the quality of the innovations and by the contribution of innovations to the increase in our quality of life. And that is a debate that is uh, worthy of us giving thought to it. 
The, when we talk about productivity, productivity is linked to the previous question, and that brings us to our value scale. How do we determine values? And do values have prices? Is the market a good vehicle, including the innovation market? Is it a good vehicle for social value? And this also leads me to the green economy. The way the metrics today, the way we measure productivity, does not necessarily correspond to the metrics that we should have to take into account the need for the green transition. Another important topic in our debate is artificial intelligence and employment. Should we be expecting a complete shift in the labor market to the destruction, massive destruction of jobs? Empirical studies that we have today show that this is not really what's happening. There's a recent article by Eric Brinjamson I'm sorry, I'm massacring your name, that there are jobs and that we have to look at the productivity of these jobs in a certain number of fields, in particular the least qualified employees. And this is very interesting, but the question behind uh, this, the employment, will artificial intelligence serve the productivity of the employees or will we be substituting capital t to labor? And I think, again, this is a very important point that we need to discuss. I'll conclude with the role of public policy and the notion of democracy. There is a, a series of questions that look at public policy. If we see that the economic and social benefits of artificial intelligence are not predetermined, that we have to guide them according to the social quality of the innovations, in that case we have to build them and then we have to look at the role of the state. How do we create the incentives to push innovation in the right direction? In order to make these societal choices, there has to be a democratic debate, and this is one of the main challenges of artificial intelligence. Everything that is going on around social media, etc., this weakens democracy. It also makes it possible to control citizens through, the, through advertising in particular. So this is an important point in our discussions, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much for this brilliant introduction. We can applaud Pierre, and we'll move directly on to Eric Brynjolfsson. As Pierre said, you're one of the biggest specialists to work on artificial intelligence. Let's try to be as tangible as possible in this roundtable. Give us examples to tell us how artificial intelligence is used in different industries. Thank you. Uh, je ne parle pas Francais, so I'm going to speak English. Uh, my apologies for that. Um, as was said, uh, AI is, is one of, there's a lot of hype and noise about AI, but it's also one of the most transformative technologies of our era. You could compare it to electricity or the steam engine. These are what economists call general purpose technologies that affect not just one or two applications, but applications all across the economy. Uh, in my lab at the Stanford Digital Economy Lab and others, we've researched some specific applications. Um, we've looked at call centers, we've looked at coding, we've looked at writing, sales, management consulting. In each of these, we saw significant productivity gains, and as Pierre mentioned, often it was the least skilled workers that benefited the most. So for instance, in the case of the call center, the, the customer service application, we looked at a company that had 5,000 call center workers, uh, some of which had access to a general uh, a GPT, a uh, uh, large language model that would help them answer questions better, and some of them did not. And so we were able to get causal estimates of how much of a difference it made. What we found was that within about four to five months, the people who had access to the technology were on average about 14% more productive in terms of handling questions better, better responses, faster response time. Uh, we found that the least skilled workers had about a 35% improvement, and the most skilled workers very little. Um, so there's a real gradient there. We also found that customer satisfaction went up significantly, and customer sentiment, if you looked at the words that were used, there were many more happy words and fewer angry words in the transcripts with the uh, large language model. Uh, finally, even the workers themselves seemed to be better off. We were worried that this would become kind of an electronic sweatshop, but instead what we found was that there was less turnover among the workers who had access to the technology. They also seemed to be happier. Um, there were a few occasions where the technology failed, um, where 
because as all big technology systems, sometimes it was unavailable for several hours. And what I was surprised to see was that the workers who had been using with the technology continued to perform better. So it wasn't that they had replaced their thinking, it had actually helped them learn faster how to answer customer questions. Now this is a specific application, and we need to do more work to understand other cases like this, but more and more research is being done and finding that this technology can, in many cases, contrary to Bob Gordon and others, um, lead to significant productivity gains. And so I'm optimistic about what we'll be seeing in the coming decade. Là, il y a beaucoup de choses de ce que vous dites autour de l'IA classique, si je peux le dire ainsi. Around classic AI, we doubt, we're worried. It's complicated to see what generative AI will bring as new accelerations. How do you see that? Everyone's in their proof of concept phase, and we haven't gone past that yet. Well, many companies are in the proof of concept phase. I think we're still at the very early stage, maybe 1% or a few percent of the potential. Um, Classical machine learning, if you can call it that, it's less than 10 years old, has been mostly used to make predictions to help people diagnose problems in, 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 in human disease or machinery or uh, make other sorts of classifications. Uh, it, it can identify cancer better than human radiologists. And this predictive type of AI is um, opening up, a, a, I think, a gold mine of opportunities. And we are already seeing some big benefits there. The new AI that we're seeing in the past two years or so is generative AI, and hopefully everybody here has had a chance to work with uh, Gemini or ChatGPT or Claude or some of the other large language models. If you haven't, you can do it for free um, and, and, and play with it a little bit, and you can see that it not only uh, predicts or diagnoses things, it also will generate new kinds of content. So it can help you write your emails or even memos or songs or music. Um, this is a different kind of AI than what we saw before, and even the, the top AI researchers that I work with at Stanford, MIT, around the world have been surprised at how powerful it's been and able to, to solve a lot of questions. Uh, they honestly didn't expect it to, to work so well as it is working, and this is opening up some new possibilities. Mm. In particular, what we're finding is that if you simply make the models larger and larger, more computer power, more data, more parameters, uh, there's a predictable improvement in the performance. These are called scaling laws. And one of the reasons the companies, the super scalers like uh, Google and OpenAI are spending so much money is they're finding that as they keep making them larger, the performance on uh, medical exams, legal exams, writing memos is predictably improving. So we probably have at least about another 10x improvement ahead of us in the coming years as uh, the next generation of GPT-5 and Gemini and mm. Pod 4 come out. On va continuer à essayer d'être comme ça. So we'll continue to be as tangible as possible uh, with uh, the head of Huawei, uh, Migang Zong. So you're very up to date on uh, AI. What is Huawei's vision on this question? Huawei, as a technology supplier, works on all technologies, and we focus on AI. 98% or more is used in the industrial domain right now. We've focused essentially on this vision, and we developed our a generative AI platform based on a, a, a certain foundation, and then we diversified into different sectors, but always in the industrial domain. So what's important is that Huawei is both an actor in AI, but also a facilitator. A facilitator, because when we talk about AI, we can't forget the cloud and the capacity of the of storing in the cloud, the improvement in performance, and the volume capacity of the cloud. This is all very important. So we talk about 5G technology that makes it possible to have this AI, particularly in the industrial field, that is now everywhere. And we, we talk about AI, but we also talk about edge computing as a whole, 
So this is where Huawei acts as a facilitator in terms of AI technology. Olivier Nolan for SAP. We'll continue to go around the table. It's important to be tangible and to look at the ambitions of each of, of your companies, of people who work in industry. You, most people have used SAP as software. Where do you stand on AI? As we said, AI is not really new again. We've been working with it for 10 years now in its previous generation. What's interesting in generative AI is that we can automate a lot of repetitive tasks. So there are productivity gains that are very important that will be beneficial to our customers. To be very tangible, we are present in a lot of customers. We're the back, digital backbone of many companies across the world. And as such, we produce a lot of data. You have to remember that artificial intelligence without quality data is not is worthless or will produce false results and will not help the company. So we're lucky to be sitting on a wealth of data. We're investing and integrating solutions directly with this generative AI. We already have 50 or so processes that have been uh, boosted. We'll have 100 or so by the end of the year. So we're really in the proof of concept phase, maybe a little bit further. The adoption of companies is clear. But what we're seeing is that we're just at the beginnings. We're learning every day. This generative AI is evolving quickly. And without getting too technical behind generative AI, there are language models, different language models. So we are developing our own LLM. We're using each, we work with others, and each brings in their specific characteristics and their ability to do things differently. We work with the company in terms of automation of configuration and code. We work with Microsoft on a concrete process in HR, which is a complicated one in companies. That's the creation of job sheets, job descriptions, also interview, non-biased interview sheets. And this is with OpenAI that we do this. Another concrete case in the financial field is the invoice payment collection. So we have AI that will analyze the financial data in the system, all of the invoices that are late, and it will make it possible to determine the best strategy to collect on the payment. It will propose the best strategy to relaunch, to send a reminder to the customer to draft a, a letter or an email to send the reminder to the companies. Yes, so those are very tangible cases. So Doris Birkhofer, you're the head of Siemens in France, and you work with SAP and AI. How do you, in your factories, because you have factories in France, uh, with how can you make AI as effective as possible? You said when we prepared this round table that, above all, you have to know how to find the data. As Olivier said, SAP and Siemens are the two biggest software editors in Europe. We work together to propose joint solutions to our customers. We use SAP and we work together on a usage case, thanks to AI, to do predictive accounting, to make it possible to anticipate the quality uh, uh, and level of the work. As you said, the core issue is the quality of the data. It's the gold in companies now, the new gold. And there's a comment that really struck me during uh, Jensen Wong, who you, you talked about NBGA, it's the third biggest global capitalization. During a Siemens conference with lots of uh, heads of the group, he said, of your company. Data is not the topic of the IT department. It is the topic of the CEO. It's a, st it's a strategic topic, and the CEOs really have to be interested in it. Since we're talking about industry, just to give you, it's important what you're saying. Are you, are you testing all the software that you give to your teams? Are, have you been trained to use AI? That's a good question. 
the role of the CEO is to ensure that there's a real data strategy so that it's structured, that we have the right tools for the teams and that the teams are using the, the tools. It's so complex that I'm, I'm not an expert in data, but my role is to ensure that companies use it in the right way. We talked about data and industry. Just to give you a figure, one, a modern factory today that's highly automated generates each month 2,000 terabytes of data, 500,000 films. On Netflix, you find 20,000 movies or films. It's huge. All this data exists, but we have to do something with it. In most companies, the data is on paper, in Excel files, in databases. So our role as a company like Siemens, our raison d'etre is to combine the re-world. We've been doing this for 175 worlds, and to combine it with the digital world in order to identify usage cases throughout the value chain in order to help accelerate, optimize, and deal with the big uh, stakes of the time that are complex. We, we've been doing it, but in future, we're going to do it better and faster. Guillaume Léger, you founded Explain. Maybe everyone doesn't know Explain, so can you tell us in just a few words? Thank you, Emmanuel. I'm happy to be here this morning. This is a fascinating period because today we're starting to stand back and be able to have look at AI, see what works now, what will work in the future. Explain is an AI company, and our role is to re-enchant public procurement. I'm not sure if you have already answered uh, public calls for tenders. So, <laughs> yes, it's it's always really fun. So we're going to make it more enchanting. So it's a huge proposal. Public procurement represents 12 percent of global GDP. So transforming this is uh, I mean, it's a significant increase in productivity. And uh, public procurement processes are fastidious. So before I explain, I had to read the uh, specifications of calls for tenders every day. So at Expert, we're a technology company, an AI company, that will automate all of the tasks that we can in these uh, processes to respond to calls for tenders. And now, over time, we see that there are tangible applications that work with AI. There's medicine, also in the legal field, as well as in public procurement. This is a usage case that today can be transformed thanks to a generative AI. A good part of the CAC 40 companies are your customers. It's fastidious to send in bids for tenders. And now companies can answer all of them thanks to AI, the work that Explain is doing. There are big groups some that are our customers, but the challenge is really to be able to propose to any company to be able to position themselves in a, in a tender. More companies respond, the better off the offer will be and the, the better will be the public services rendered. So the challenge is not only to draft, but it's also to properly select the uh, public procurement contract. I'm going to be a little bit technical here. So it's a company consultation dossier. It's uh, several thousand pages. If you do it once a year, it's fine. But if you do it several times per week, you need to be enchanted. You need help. Yes. Eric, uh, I'm going to come back to you. How do you see artificial intelligence remodeling the economic landscape in terms of productivity, in terms of growth? Can you tell us, can you give us some specific examples where AI has considerably improved the efficiency? As Pierre said earlier, what's really important is to see productivity gains, what it can provide. Yes, I agree. Uh, productivity is ultimately what we're hoping for. That is getting more output with less input. It doesn't mean working harder. It means uh, having more resources to address what's happening in the environment, healthcare, poverty. And I believe that this is the big opportunity for the coming decade for us to substantially improve productivity, at least a doubling of productivity growth rates in the United States to about 3% from 1.5%, or maybe more ambitiously, a doubling of the levels to have us be about twice as wealthy by the end of the decade, the more uh, extreme uh, 
cases. Now, we heard lots of very specific examples here, and I think all of you who are in, in businesses or in government have heard many, many examples of particular places where AI might help. You've also heard, hopefully, uh, understand that there's also a lot of hype, and you've got to be careful that there's a lot of nonsense out there. And so what we're trying to do is have a more data-driven approach to assessing all of these. Um, about five years ago, I wrote a paper with Tom Mitchell, head of machine learning at uh, Carnegie Mellon, about what can machine learning do, where we systematically analyzed 18,000 individual tasks. Uh, we pioneered what we call the task-based approach. Instead of looking at, at whole companies or occupations, we break it down into very fine-grained tasks. And then each of these tasks we assess, and we found uh, a pattern for which ones machine learning could help. And then just two weeks ago, one of my students, uh, Daniel Rock, working with a team from OpenAI, had a paper come out in Science, which applied the same methodology for generative AI, and also looked at those 18,000 tasks, and found that about 40%, uh, about two-fifths of the tasks in the U.S. economy could, in principle, be done better, at least twice as efficiently, with generative AI. And I think it would be similar in France and, and, and other countries. But this taxonomy, this task-based approach, where it goes through them, can now be applied to individual companies. Daniel Rock and I, uh, along with a Andy McAfee and, and others, have started a company called WorkHelix, where we've captured, put this technology into software. And what WorkHelix will do is we'll scan all of the tasks in any given company, uh, larger companies, smaller companies, and identify which ones are most likely to be applicable. What we're hoping is we can compress, as Pierre mentioned, it often takes uh, 10 years or more for the full benefits of a powerful new technology like electricity, we think that can become much faster, just a, a few years, if companies have a data-driven approach to assessing all of these tasks. But it can't be done with anecdotes and examples from vendors. It can't be done at a very high level of looking at a whole company. You have to go very fine-grained to these individual tasks and have a data-driven approach to doing it. And that's what uh, WorkHelix is doing. Vraiment, c'est passionnant. Ming Hang Zhang, on va poursuivre avec vous. Doris nous disait euh, il y a un instant euh, à quel point c'est important. We're going to continue. Gérer, la... You were saying how important it is to be able to manage the data, recover it. So you also internally developed uh, your own. So Ongu, I think, it means that it's possible to manage the data in a secure way. Yes, Ongu, this is the model that we have developed, and. Uh, there are two levels. first level is the basic uh, the base that we use, uh, and then we have a strategy for, for, for sector. Our vision is 98% to replace industrial use and so on. And uh, at the moment, we have developed about a good uh, 10 sectors. We have uh, manufacturing, uh, we've got uh, uh, port management, cities, uh, R&D, medication, and everything which is uh, concerns weather forecasts and so on. So I'd like to give a concrete example for a group on working on spare parts, for instance, made of aluminum and alloys. It's a major group with about uh, 10 uh, plants in, located in China. They started a production. Uh, and in 2019, when 5G came along, they got in touch with us to see what we could do together. So we really transformed the, the, so with the whole of the ecosystem. We, we, here we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, but in the industrial world and everything in the ecosystem concerning the different uh, terminals and the result. Imagine a large workshop, big as a football ground, closed, of course, about 40 degrees inside, large, very high humidity rate, there are a lot of machines doing the molding and so on. Last year, I visited it, really impressive inside. I met about 20 people for such large manufacturing unit. And uh, the results they got is 
There's no one managing the machines anymore. The machines have, and uh, artificial intelligence with 5G uh, manage all this, and the result is that they increased the use of these machines by more than 30 percent. And uh, more than more than 15 had increased by more than 15 percent the number of parts. The positive impact between 10 to 20 percent in the uh, in the manufacturing costs. That is very concrete and something else. I won't go into detail, for instance. But you have, for instance, weather forecasts. We can really get forecasts for 10 days in less than 10 seconds. With this, the existing systems, it used to take five hours. That is thanks to the power of AI. And uh, so, Thanks. So now we have a weather forecast. Open data has been able to put into the base of the last 43 years to be able to use as a basis for this AI. See, this is how AI can really improve the efficiency of traditional manufacturing and also change the economy in a way. Let me come back to a figure. I don't think it was mentioned before. Madame Sterley's study said that uh, the wealth provided by artificial intelligence was 2,500 to 4,000 billion dollars. Uh, it's tremendous. It's the GDP of Germany. The vision around uh, generative AI is a lot of fantasy around AI. We'll have a vision in uh, or increasing or augmenting uh, the employees and provide a kind of superpowers. It's a super personal assistant in another way. Because in the, well, you're right, it's also, it is a good example. We talk a lot about AI, we talk about co pilots coming in to, for solutions uh, as a co pilot of. Um, no, SAP has won, and for all the, those uh, who work with SAP in the past, it's a revolution because we've got to talk with uh, the software system in a natural language, ask questions, becomes an assistant, but also an analyst uh, to uh, provide data. In a more macro way regarding our question, to re-enchant industry, we saw there's been uh, an increase in volatility, it will allow countries like like those in Europe to gain productivity in their geographical areas, and also means you can concentrate on what will create extra value. Most standard tasks will be left for a generative AI, and we will insist on uh, the added value, which really is important for the business. Something also which is very important is innovation. Generative AI can speed up innovation cycles, will go faster. We can be quicker in the way of operating on a daily basis. We'll be testing more things because it's faster. Tests don't take so long, and then we will pick up, uh, pick on what's best. Yes, we will be faster. We we'll also talk about uh, the calculation power. Why can we do it today? Because we have a calculation power which is absolutely uh, crazy compared to what we had before. So simulation can be very quicker. Companies can adapt much more quickly. We have a perma crisis uh, now, and companies are suffering from their capacity not to be able to adapt as quickly as possible. And this can be done with generative AI. We had the example of the uh, COVID vaccines, these were created thanks to AI. It was able to act quickly thanks to that. Last point I wanted to mention, and particularly for Europe, we have shortages of labor in some sectors, also have some jobs because the repetitive tasks are not attractive. AI means the capacity to make jobs more attractive, you can automate uh, jobs and uh, then move towards more added value jobs. So concrete, uh, 
Uh, let's see how you use uh, genitive AI. Well, some bosses, for instance, say that you can break down the barrier language uh, because everyone can work in their own language. And if someone from uh, China and Brazil has the answer, you get the uh, answer in your own language. So how does it work for you? What we have done, we have practically have about 2,000 people outside the company uh, all worlds. They are in contact with the customers. We analyze the value chain of an industrial plant. What is it? First of all, de design ideas, prototypes. Then you've got resource planning, material, engineering. You see, how is the production process going to be covered? And then you have the operations, production itself, and then maintenance after sales. To give you a concrete example, well, with, with Microsoft, we have an industrial co-pilot. And for engineers who program the automatons, uh, the brains they say that they define the rate, they decide how the robotic arm should work. They need to need no language of uh, these auto maidens and then can exchange with the machine in their natural language. The machine will help them correct any faults and will speed up the process. It is real support for engineers. Another example, outside the actual company, but uh, very closely linked, is the management of electrical networks. You know, the electrification uses going to increases, thanks to electrical mobility and so on. And you have uh, electrical uh, network uh, managers who, who have to correct any anomalies and follow things very closely. Here we have a solution uh, as well. Thanks to AI, the network manager uh, has uh, help in finding any blackouts or any congestion and uh, programming maintenance operations. It's a very concrete example where you have a uh, support to engineers and operators. It's also a way of uh, democratizing because uh, the uh, skill level of people can be lower because uh, there is the support of AI, but it doesn't report human beings in our plants and uh, infrastructures. You use uh, private AI adapted to Siemens and to L'Oréal, for instance, have their own AI, so does Veolia. We have our BLM uh, platform for developing products. We do work internally. We look what's on the market. We use a co-pilot which, uh, from Microsoft, which reacts. Uh, we combine the, the, because then you have a question of securing your own data. Well, so this is the da customer data, and then the customers decide whether they want to open up their data to other players. Um, it's not public data, it's just specific to the business. And I say you have to make sure you structure the data right uh, to, so you know where they are available in the company. Let me continue with you. You are a French company. This question to the question of technology. What did you use as a basis? Is it important to be sovereign regarding the issue of AI? If you can be so in France and Europe. You. So to come back to what we've just heard. Uh, a year and a half, we had JetGDP. Uh, JetGDP came out. They have the world's going to change and everything without it being very specific. Here you have concrete examples of working AI, and it's specialized AI, vertical today. What works is uh, sort of works on specific cases. Go down to the detail to understand what tasks can be automated, what can't and uh, will uh, provide the uh, language particularly for this cases. That's why we created Explain. The fact that we are hearing this uh, shows that we're getting out of hype and we're really getting concrete to what AI can change. And to get to the end, I won't talk so much about sovereignty, but ecosystem. I think what is essential is to be able to develop an ecosystem 
We have a good position in France to do that. When I talk about ecosystem and knock about tens of uh, millions of dollars, massively injected, money is important, but not it's not everything. When you look at the most highest performance uh, ecosystem in the world, Silicon Valley. Why is Silicon Valley? Because a startup in uh, Silicon Valley will first find customers in the Silicon Valley. They have an initial customer base which will allow them to go and conquer the world. That is an ecosystem. It's something we're seeing in France. We have partners, for instance, of Mistral. We use the LLM of Mistral to be included in uh, Explain. We give money to a Mistral, then we sell our solution to a lot of companies, major groups in particular. I think that major groups in French and Europe can really play a role so that the companies born in France can use their worldwide footprint to develop. Because when today you create a startup in AI, the ambition is clear. The idea is not to stay in France, it's to become a world leader. And in France, we're not doing badly in, in public markets, but with the, we could teach others a lot. So you're, you're conquering the world. Well, we're starting with France. I come from Alsace, so I start with Alsace first, France, and then the world. And I think that beyond sovereignty, I think the notion of ecosystem, a strong ecosystem, is important. That means funding, research, training, we have it, and then you have to find customers. We've got them, and hopefully we'll have more and more. Eric, on the question of sovereignty, it's really important. And do you think that, with your global point of view, that Europe still has a place between the United States and China, which, of course, is not lagging behind? Absolutely, no. Europe has a tremendous opportunity. We hear here on the stage some of the people who are driving AI in Europe, and I'd like to see a lot more of that. But there is a perception that Europe isn't doing as much as it could. Uh, I heard one pundit uh, quip that uh, America innovates, uh, China replicates, and Europe regulates. <laughs> I don't know if that's entirely true, but I, I think it doesn't have to be that oh, way. Yeah. Certainly, we see a lot of innovation coming out of China. My friend Kai Fu Li has a wonderful book called AI Superpowers, describing the, the ecosystem in China that's inventing so many amazing technologies. Obviously, at Silicon Valley, we see that. But Europe, I think, is, is not doing as much as it could. There are so many smart people here, uh, some of them on the stage, but also my friends like uh, Jan LeCun, who invented many of the core technologies that are being used. And, and when I talk to him, uh, he's very passionate about pushing the frontier further and, and spends time here. I see, uh, I see Jean Tirole and Philippe Aguillon here and so many other intellectuals who are understanding more how uh, the economics of technology can be improved. Um, and there are some tech companies like Mistral that are very much on the frontier of developing these large language models. When I was meeting with uh, Bruno Le Maire uh, last month, uh, the Minister of Economy here in, in France, uh, he was very passionate about unlocking some of the, the brain power that's in this room and that's around uh, France to contribute more on the innovation side as well as on the replication and, and regulation side. Uh, I'm optimistic that we will see that more. I think there's a change happening in Europe that is uh, unlocking some of that potential, more entrepreneurship, uh, more freedom to, to innovate. And that will be very good for the world. It'll be good for America, it'll be good for China if uh, Europe and France in particular uh, starts unlocking some of those uh, uh, capabilities of the entrepreneurs and the bigger companies. C'est intéressant ce que vous dites sur la souveraineté. What you're saying about sovereignty and freedom is interesting. How can we try, maybe we haven't talked about it enough for the time being, how can we guarantee a responsible use in uh, maybe a fair and a way? I think that the technology is able to unleash a lot of productivity and some specific applications economy-wide, but it also has some real genuine dangers. Uh, the technology can, can create bias, privacy innovations. Uh, there are deep fakes that can control the narrative in social media to of the course. point where almost we're losing free will because it controls what we hear, what we understand. I think we may, where people are working on super intelligent systems, but we're already beginning to have super persuasive systems, systems that could control what we think and believe. And that's a little bit of a scary possibility. There are also real dangers when it comes to uh, employment and disruption. I don't think we're seeing it yet, but it's not hard to imagine that as, as we get those 40% of tasks 
being augmented by AI, there's going to be tremendous economic disruption. And last but not least, I do think there are some real catastrophic risks. These technologies can be used to create uh, new kinds of viruses or other weapons or cyber weapons that, that we couldn't even imagine before. So it's important to have some regulation and, and have some controls on those dangers. And if it's done right, I think that actually can speed the positive development. People often think of this as one dimension. Either you have more innovation or more regulation. Actually, you can have more of both. The right kind of regulation will speed the adoption of the technology. Let me give you a specific example. Um, in the United States, I'm working with uh, the people in Congress to understand better what are the rights of the content creators, the people who, who create uh, new art, new music, new writing, uh, versus the large language models that are using this and ingesting it. And how do you balance those rights? Right now, there's a lot of hesitation in adopting large language models in big companies because they don't understand the property rights of, of who's going to have to be paid. Mm. If we can have more clarity on that and more interoperability so that we have uh, uh, clear rules of the road, I think it will actually speed up the adoption because having that kind of a, a framework that defines property rights is one of the basic needs for a well-functioning economic free market. So. Having the clarity around this and having uh, uh, people in government who understand the technology well enough to write intelligent regulations can simultaneously reduce some of those dangers, but also speed up the, the uh, beneficial applications of artificial intelligence. Mm. Mingang, uh, sur la question justement de la souveraineté. Uh, On the question of sovereignty, I don't want to offend you. Why, why you tend to be, can be sometimes criticized by, by the Americans? How can you reassure? with uh, AI on the issue. Before answering this, uh, let me pick up on what Eric has just said. I believe that today, I say it is time, and it is really important, we are changing our viewpoint, innovation, replication, and now we have to see the an improvement everywhere. We have to see how, if we talk about innovation in the West, uh, United, in the United States and regulation in Europe, I think we have to change this vision of things. When you asked about sovereignty, and I will answer it in a minute, so it's important. It's important to clarify these points. Otherwise, if I say to you, in terms of technology, when we talk about sovereignty, for AI, for instance, the common basis that we you we use open data, there is no training with the customer data, for instance, you believe me or not. Well, you're not you wouldn't, I mean, you're not going to lie to us if we say we don't use, when we say we don't use customer data. That is a starting point that you need to explain. Otherwise, it's no good to explain. On, with 5G, what is 5G? 5G, we've all checked it, tested, and examined it closely in France and elsewhere. This information provided by Huawei, and it's going to be available in France in two years' time. If we talk about sovereignty, we're not collecting any data. There is no network built by Huawei where there is, uh, we have access to data. Once we deliver it, we just give a key, and if you don't have a problem, if you don't you don't need to call upon you. Where you say it's not a, no problem. So more concretely regarding 5G, everything is checked and verified on the cloud. It's, it is important to support uh, AI. The cloud about a month ago. The Huawei cloud we was, uh, was checking the conformity with uh, ChatGPT. Uh, LGBT 
sorry, 2015-2016 came into force. So we made sure that we were compliant with all the regulations with Hawaii. So sovereignty is an important subject. Uh, and uh, what is your vision? Olivier. A couple of points concerning the question of responsibility. I think uh, technology groups uh, have a strong responsibility in AI provided to our customers. For instance, very early on, we had uh, an ethics committee to make sure that we had the right responsibility level towards our, cust our customers. The second concern, regulation and innovation. I think our position is that, of course, in Europe, we need to have a regulatory framework which protects the citizens and uh, businesses, protects the data that is an uh, essential. But this regulation must not slow down innovation. And today, I think it was a good uh, uh, summary. We tend to have too much regulation. But we have an excellent opportunity today. We have the capacity in Europe, thanks to this fifth industrial revolution, to catch up uh, our uh, delay in the field of technology. Everything wants doing the same thing at the same time. Which we just, well, we already, I think we'll have the capacity to bring, come up to the right level, and I think we can even surge ahead. The cards have been dealt again. It's, it's a major innovation. We're changing paradigm. So we have this capacity. You can see we're able to bring uh, champions like Mistral in France. In Germany, we have others. But to, it's also... We need to have massive investment plans because a lot of investment necessary, not only uh, public side, uh, alliances between technology groups like Siemens, SAP, and industrial groups who need to ally to encourage this. Uh, soon need to close. I'd like your opinion, though, Doris, because we mentioned it several times. But how do you get the teams on board? You say it might be an extra support, but how can you, you train the teams without getting into politics is certainly one of the major concerns. Uh, say that maybe a machine will be more important uh, to do a better job than to do a better job. How do you deal with that? Another reassuring message for Europe. We are be maybe behind, but uh, in industry, the world leaders in automation and digitization are European companies, Siemens, Schneider, ABB. And uh, for AI, you need to know the real world. You need to, we need to use the strengths that we have and go on developing and speeding up the use of AI by combining with uh, automation. You mustn't lose this advance. We also need innovation as a kind of double revolution, both in technology and human level, so that people are not afraid because people are afraid. If people are always afraid of what they don't know. You need to make AI known. So information is essential. At Siemens, we have a digital uh, learning platform, and all the employees, right from the operator to CEO, need to do a number of digital teaching hours. In our summer university for employees, it's based on AI. It's basics for everyone up to a higher level, so that everyone becomes familiar with AI. Then the third element is to involve uh, the employees when the uses which are made. So we're going, after the summer, we're going to have a major uh, workshop to see how AI can be productive and how they can improve the quality of work, uh, well-being of employees. There's always a dual challenge when we talk about uh, productivity and competitiveness, but not forgetting the employees themselves. Another word, you were know, saying, it's, you said you're going to conquer the world without a 
generative AI, would you be limited to conquering Alsace, Lorraine? Alsace first, because Lorraine comes later. Yes, absolutely. So the generative AI uh, translation solutions have been entirely solved. We we're talking about uh, training employees, but I think you also must do educate the general public. Everyone is concerned by AI today, whether they know it or, or not, whether they want to. They, everyone uses AI today. AI is not magic. Uh, mathematical and statistical models, which are practice on uh, large databases with high calculation speed. If you want people to start using it, they need to know how it understands how it works. Then if you talk about the ecological impact, the calculation power, we can add more calculation power. If we look over the five last years, but they did we need water and electricity. But, uh, but the impact Google has said that the emissions of CO2 have gone up by 48% over the last uh, uh, five years because of the calculation speed. When you think about AI, you plant uh, hundreds of uh, millions of users professionally. You have to think of systems with a limited, uh, uh, with a limited uh, use of electricity. So it's something we need to think about it. So, Pierre, you have a minute to conclude. Well, thank you. In a minute, five ideas that uh, five ideas from this discussion. What is happening is amazing. It's really a source of optimism and something we need in a rather morose environment I don't need to uh, discuss. And then there is a great uh, increase in the production of employees uh, possible, which have to be carefully. It's going to take time. It requires training, equipment, but the potential is tremendous. Third, the key is data, as I said several times. And the use of data doesn't go without a value system, and we didn't talk much about it, but I think it brings us back to democracy, choice of values, and this is more important because we are at a key point in the French debate. And uh, let's be pay attention to democracy. That's a message. Then AI is also a link with knowledge. Here's, I say, as a professor, now we have access to a lot of information. What creates um, knowledge on values? How can we use AI to teach? And I think this is absolutely essential. Last point. Benefit will be there with about 4,000 billion, but I think it's underestimated. I think it will be far, far more than that. But there are three questions here. What speed, what cost, and what scale? It depends on the ecosystem that we manage to build with training, participation, research, and regulation. And we hope that the regulators will know what they're doing. Certainly, a lot of round tables around AI next in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.